So thanks for the invitation and for everything. So um, the plan for today's talk is, is that we will think about um, basically how to think about structure of networks. So this is, this is the, uh, the bottom line and then I plan to sort of walk you through a few, a few different things. So I will start at the beginning, right? So the first thing is where do I get networks, right? And basically there is lots and lots of, net of data that can very naturally be represented as networks, right? So social networks are just one example and there are many, many other examples where, where you can take some data and sort of the most natural way to look at that kind of data is to represent it as a graph, as a set of vertices and, set, and um, a set of edges, arcs or connections between these nodes, right? So you can look at social networks, um, which is Facebooks and things like that. You can take collaboration networks now where your nodes are humans and you connect two, two nodes if they wrote a paper together or if they collaborated together. You can take networks from cell biology. So basically you can take proteins or genes as nodes and you connect them if they interact, if they work together to produce some new protein or something, right? And now you can study how the cell works through the, um, by analyzing those kinds of networks. Um, web and citation networks is another, are, another, are another example of a very simple case of networks, right? And then uh, computer networks, basically the internet, how computers talk to one another, and communication networks, those are all, again, kinds of data, data that can nat naturally be represented as graphs, right? So this is basically the data we'll be working with. And then the next question is, if you are a scientist, right, is how are these graphs organized, right? So what kind of structures, patterns do I see in these graphs, right? And um, usually when we plot networks, at least in our mind, we have pictures like this and pictures like that, right? So really what I would like to uh, dive into today is how should I think about structure of these large networks and what kind of sort of mental images should I have for myself somewhere in the back of my brain, right? Um, so this is basically what I, what I want to talk about. And the level of organization of these networks that I want to talk about is called the level of communities, right? So really the way we, we think of networks is that we say that um, nodes in these networks, maybe humans, people are organized into this kind of tightly connected clusters, right? So for example, this is a set of, this is a network where every node is a scientist and connections are people who worked or published together. And what you see in this network that there are sort of these clumps of nodes that tend to work, that tend to work together. And maybe these clumps correspond to all the researchers in a particular sub area, or maybe these are all the researcher, researchers coming from the same university and so on. And also in like social Social networks, you expect to see this kind of communities or clumps or groups of nodes, right? Mm -hmm. And um, there are many other cases where these communities naturally arise, right? On the web, if you think of the web as a graph, so web pages and hyperlinks, communities could correspond to topically related sets of pages. Or for example, if you take citation networks, then sort of if you, if you would do community detection in citation networks, mm -hmm. the communities would probably correspond to scientific sub-disciplines or particular areas or particular cliques where people like to cite each other. Um, if for example, on the web, this is a very, sort of a very, in some sense, famous picture. So every node here is a blog. And um, the connections between the blog represents which blog tend to, tends to cite which other blog. And um, red and blue are for the Republican and Democrats. And sort of what you find here is that you have this sort of very nicely, you know, the, um, the, the, Democrat, the Democratic part of the blogosphere and the Republican part of the blogosphere. And there are very few connections across, right? So now you have one community and the other community. So basically the idea is that the network structure already reveals something about what is the, the underlying thing in the network. Um, what I have here is another collaboration network. This is all the people from uh, Santa Fe Institute. And again, you sort of see these tightly connected clusters and um, each cluster corresponds to a set. If you then go and, and examine what are the people corresponding to that cluster, you see that they sort of work on different topical areas. Um, maybe from computer science point of motivation, here's another, another view of why, why you may want to be interested in communities. So what I'm showing you here is uh, what is called an adjacency matrix, right? So I have nodes here and nodes there, and I have a dot wherever there is an edge between this node and that node, right? 
and um, the, what are the nodes in my network now? I have advertisers, and these are the queries they bid on, right? So basically in web search, you have the ads, and a particular advertiser can bid on a particular query. So the idea is that whenever somebody searches for a line here, all these guys will compete to have their ad displayed ne next to that query, right? And now the idea is if you now go and search for clusters in this kind of network, then you would find structures like this, and maybe what you would find is that all these advertisers tend to bid on a common set of queries, and if you would look at, examine what these queries are, it would turn out that all these queries are about gambling, and you know, this sub part of them are about uh, sports betting and so on, right? So again, all I want to say is, communities are of interest, right? So, so now if I want to think about these cluster C networks, the question is how, how do I go and how do I find them, right? So the way, the way we mentally picture this kind, the structure of networks that have clusters, here I, I'm showing you three examples from the literature, right? So that's the sort of the, the version 1.0, right? So you think that you have, you have the three clusters, you have, you have nodes in these clusters, there are lots of connections between the members of the cluster and a few connections pointing outside the cluster, right? And now if you sort of get a bit fancier, you, you arrive to this picture where now again I sort of have three clusters, but then each of these three, three big clusters sort of has um, some subclusters, right? So sort of I have now a hierarchy of clusters. And if I even get fancier, then I arrive to the pictures like this where I say that now clusters can even overlap. So maybe these red nodes are the, maybe in a social network, these are people that belong to multiple communities or multiple clusters, right? So this is one, one image that we have in our mind when thinking about networks. Um, the other image that I want to contrast this in this talk is the following image. Actually, it turns out when you look at large networks, they look like this. Sort of, they look like an onion, or um, they have this called, they call it a core periphery structure, or they call it a jellyfish structure, or a octopus structure, right? So these are all um, technical terms that refer to structures like this, right? So that, that, that sort of that your network is composed of these concentric circles that get denser and denser, and really there are no clusters in here, right? It's sort of just this mass that gets denser and denser. Think of like you cut an onion across, right? So really what my talk um, today will be about will be how do you reconcile this picture and that picture, right? So if, if my networks look like this, then they cannot look like that. And if they look like this, then they cannot look like that. So how, could, how should I think about clusters so that these two pictures come together? So this is really um, what I want to uh, talk about today is how do you sort of put these two seemingly different views about the structure of the networks um, together, okay? And um, what I want to do for the rest of the talk is I want to first focus on this side of the picture and, sh and sort of show you how you arrive to the conclusion that large networks have this kind of structure. And then I want to make a step back and actually start talking about communities and bring the two pictures together. So that's, that's basically um, what I want to talk about today. Um, so the first thing that I want to talk about is how do you arrive to this, this notion that networks have this kind of uh, core periphery structure where you sort of have this densely connected core and then this sparsely connected periphery. And the way we will think about this is basically we'll say, okay, how could I quantify how well does the network organize into clusters? And then sort of a next step will be to say, okay, what kind of computational experiment could I design that would reveal me something useful about the organization of networks, right? And the idea will be, so I have it here, right, that we will basically use approximation algorithms to the um, in, um, empty hard graph partitioning problems, sort of as some kind of experimental probes in the um, structure of our networks. So I'll make this more precise. So really the way we will think about this is the following. We will say if this is, if, if we think of networks like this, then we will say let's go and try to identify clusters in networks and maybe not just trying to identify them, but let's try to measure how well are these clusters expressed in networks, right? And then we will design a measure that will tell me how well are the clusters expressed and we will learn something from that measure, right? And um, now if I want to go um, search for these clusters, a working definition um, of these clusters is basically that I want to find sets of nodes that have lots of connections between the members of the set and very few connections pointing out, outside the set, right? Sort of this kind of intuition. And um, then the sets of nodes that have this kind of property, I call them communities or I call them clusters or groups or modules or I give them some name, right? So really 
um, there, is, there has been the whole scientific industry now. How do you take this, this intuition and how do you sort of um, transform it to, into some kind of algorithm or something that at the end will go and find these sets of nodes that have this kind of property, right? Um, and I will touch um, on a few of these. So um, really my question will be, you know, is this the right way to think about uh, the structure of networks? Um, okay, so here is, here is the, here's sort of the, if you have ever seen a single social network, then you must have seen this one, right? So this is the, the, um, the it's called Zachary's Karate Club Network. So the idea was that there was uh, Zachary who was a PhD student. He was uh, studying social ties in a karate club. And during the history of this karate club in the university, there was a, there was a conflict and the, the club split into two clubs. And then one club formed around the, the, um, the, 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 the instructor of the previous club and another club formed around one of, one of its members, right? And what I show you here is um, all the squares formed the second club and all the circle, circles formed another club, right? So at the beginning, this was one karate club and then the people split and circles went to form one and the squares went to form another one. And now if you say, given just the network structure, could I sort of reconstruct and in some sense predict whether people will go with the circles or whether they will decide to go to the squared club. The, the, way, the way to find this division is by basically trying to split the network into two equally sized uh, halves such that there is the smallest number of edges crossing this boundary, right? So this is basically one intuition why searching for sets of nodes that have lots of connections between the members and very few connections pointing across would find you sort of clusters that correspond to something uh, real from the real life, right? So uh, that's basically the, the basic intuition why searching for densely connected sets of nodes uh, might be useful. So now going back to what we want to do, right? So we would like to design a measure or something that will say how community-like is a set of nodes, right? So how good of a community is a set of nodes, right? So now I will take a set of nodes S and my intuition is still to say, aha, uh -huh, good communities have many edges between the members of the set and few edges pointing outside, right? So now if I give you examples of two sets, so there I have my set S and below I have my set S prime and I ask you which is the, which of these two is a better community, is more community-like. I think we would all sort of decide that this is a better community. Why? Because it has more edges between the members and it has fewer edges pointing outside than my, um, than my green community up there, right? So one way to formalize this intuition into an, uh, an objective function or in some kind of a, uh, metric is, uh, is uh, the notion that comes from um, theoretical computer science, it's called conductance. And really all the conductance does is the following. It says how many edges point uh, outside the set, right? These are all the edges where one endpoint is in the set and the other endpoint is outside the set. So in, in this case, I have two edges pointing outside and um, below I just take the sum of the degrees of all the nodes uh, inside S. So the way you can think about this term is just to say how many edges do I have inside my set S, right? And I take this ratio, the smaller the ratio, the better the community, right? So um, the, the conductance of set S prime is smaller than conductance of set S, okay? So that's the first thing we, we, we need to have. It's basically the simplest um, formalization of this intuition that I, that I started with uh, all along. Okay, so now, now I have the first thing. So now what I want to do is I want to say, I want to define a new quantity that I will call it a network community profile. And the way I will define this quantity is the following. I will say that um, I will define this, uh, this uh, profile that will basically try to say for every cluster size, how well are clusters of that particular size expressed? How community-like are clusters of a particular size? So the way I will do this is the following. I will say, I will say uh, the following. So I have something that is a function of k. k is the size of the cluster. And then I just say, I will go over all subsets of my, of my network. The subset size has to be equal to k. And I will take the cluster that has the best quality, right? So for every cluster size, I will go find the best cluster and I will remember that, okay? And then what I will do is I will just create this plot where here is um, the logarithm of the cluster size, k. And here is the conductance of the best cluster, right? So I find the best cluster. So the way you can think about doing this is the idea is the following, right? Maybe I fix k equals five. I go search over all possible subsets of size five. 
I find the best one, and it, that gives me a dot, right? And then I say, okay, what, are, what is the best cluster of size seven? Here it is, this gives me a dot, right? And I do this for every possible k, um, right? This would be maybe the best cluster of size 10. I have it here. I do this for all possible k's, and I get, I get a line, okay? So really, um, and this is what we will be looking at. So all this is doing intuitively is to say, I have, I have cluster size here, and this tells me how good, what is the score, what is the quality of best cluster of that particular size, okay? Um, there is sort of the technical question about how do I compute this profile plot. The problem is that I can't really search over all possible subsets, right? So I, I cannot do that, right? And really the way, the way I, we do and compute this in, in practice is to use approximation algorithms to graph, graph partitioning. So basically use community detection methods. And um, computer science has developed a lot of um, uh, different approaches to finding cluster C networks. And all these approaches sort of give you, give you in some sense probably good results, but they also have um, some problems. So really the way we will do, we will compute this in practice is, this, is that we will take a particular um, sort of, we'll take a community detection method, we will find all the clusters in the network. For every cluster, we will, we will, every cluster now here will be a particular dot. So maybe I take, imagine that I take my red community detection method, I find all the clusters, every cluster um, here I, represents a dot, right? This is the size of the cluster, this is the score of that cluster, and all I do then is I find the lower envelope of, um, of this plot, right? So I would go and I would connect the minimums uh, for ev every possible k, and this gives me my, my curve, okay? So this is intuitively what we are computing. So what I want to tell you now is what can I learn from the shape of this curve, okay? So everything good so far? Any, any questions? Okay, great. So um, we know what we are computing and how we are computing it. So now, what, as I said, what I want to ask is, how does the sh this blue, blue line, what does it tell me about the structure of my networks? So um, first I'll show you a few examples to build some intuition. So imagine that I'm taking um, lattices. So basically like um, um, grids or uh, cubes or chains, right? So imagine that I take a graph that is a grid. And um, if, I, if I compute, um, if I take this big graph and I ask what, is, and I, try to find clusters in this graph, right? I try to cut this graph. I can ask what is the size of the cluster versus uh, conductance. And really conductance is measuring nothing else than sort of surface to volume ratio, right? So if I'm plotting this on uh, logarithmic scales, then for example, for a chain, I get, I get a, this line to be downward sloping with a slope one. Because basically if I have a long chain, I always need to cut one edge to get a cluster of how many, how many nodes, whatever size I want, right? So, so my conductance is always one over the number of nodes times two inside the cluster, right? So this will go down. In the grid, right? In the, if I want to cut a cluster in the grid, I need to cut sort of the perimeter of the grid and I get squared number of nodes inside, right? So this is why this has a slope of one half, right? And if I take a very dense random graph, then, then the slope of this plot will be flat, right? So um, this is one, one intuition. So the intuition here is basically if I take some graph and I compute my magic plot, then depending in some sense on the dimensionality of that object that I'm cutting, I will have the downward sloping line with a different slope, right? So if I'm, for example, taking a cube-like graph and cutting that, I get a slope of one third. And for example, if I take a real network, for example, I take a network of all the Californian roads, and I compute my plot, I will get a downward sloping plot where the slope is around one half, right? Which basically says that road networks are like grids, right? They look like this blue line here, right? So that's first piece of intuition. Um, the second piece of intuition is that actually if I go take some real world networks, for example, here is, here's the network that I showed you. This is the uh, people that work, um, that do research on network. If I compute my, my, my communities and I compute my, my community profile, here is the size of the, of the community versus the score. You again see that it's downward sloping. And you see, for example, that this particular dip here corresponds to the community that I labeled with A, right? So this cluster corresponds to this dip here. The cluster B corresponds here. If I combine C and E together, I get, um, I get that point here. So really all I want to say is, again, I see this thing uh, sloping downwards. 
Um, so really, what, what, should we, what do we know so far, if I sort of summarize and make a hypothesis, right? So what we know so far from the two examples that I gave you is that basically this, this network community profile that I showed you sort of slopes downwards, right? Sort of it has this kind of downward shape. And um, based on this example that I gave you uh, from uh, chains and grids and things like that, the, 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 the speed at which this is sort of descending would tell me something about the dimensionality of my network, right? In a very uh, soft sense. So really, the question is, what happens if I, if sort of, if I take my networks and uh, my t I take real networks that are large, right? So the example I showed you before had like 200, 300 nodes. What happens if I take graphs that have bigger size? So what we did is we took basically 200 different large networks where large means everything that has more than 10,000 nodes. And I think the largest we took had like 10 million nodes, right? And the question is, how does the shape of this plot look there? And um, here is a, here's a sort of small example that we were still able to draw. So um, this is the network, visualization of the network, and this is the, uh, the plot that I defined before, right? So cluster size versus quality, lower is better. Um, what's the surprise? The surprise is that this goes down and then goes up, right? Um, and uh, the other thing that sort of uh, uh, corresponds to, to, uh, to the picture there is, this is now the visualization, I think we did it, um, yes, in Payek, um, of that network. And what you see, right, is that sort of there is no, no, little no good clusters. Actually, if you run your community detection method and then plot the clusters, for example, the community detection method will tell you that all these blue nodes belong to one cluster, and all the red nodes up there belong to another cluster, and all these green nodes belong to some other green cluster that I, that I label there, right? So sort of something, something funny is going on, right? And this network is not that big. It has only 4,000 nodes and 10,000 edges, 13,000 edges, right? So really, to show you that this kind of down and up shape is, uh, is common. Here are different examples, so, right? So this is the live journal network, a social network, I think 7 million people. These are all the Germans that are using Microsoft Instant Messenger. Again, couple of million people. Uh, this is the bipartite network of authors to papers, uh, so scientific papers. Uh, this is citation network from high energy physics, part of the web graph. And this is the Amazon um, products co-purchasing network. So every node is a, is a, a product. And you connect nodes that get co-purchased together. Okay. What is the black line. Uh, the black line. Uh, good question. So the black line is the community profile of the random graph conditioned on the same degree distribution, right? So what this black line tells me: what if I would take the graph that has the same number of nodes, the same number of edges, and every edge has the same number of connections, but these connections go randomly? And you see that basically I lose all the structure. I I see no clusters whatsoever. So it's, it's like comparing to the baseline. But for now, it doesn't really matter. It says that networks are not random. Because if networks would be random, I would be up there, but I'm down here. So I have more structure. I have better stru more structure or more clusters than what I would expect uh, if the world would be sort of random. OK? But sort of it doesn't really matter for what I want to tell you. OK, so uh, going back, so uh, just to show you, uh, my live journal example, right? The thing goes down and goes up. So the question, basically, how should I understand this, right? What, the way I should uh, read this is to say that as, as clusters grow between, you know, from small size to, let's say, around 100, they get better and better, right? So the, the thing goes down. But then at some size, right, um, my clusters start getting worse and worse, right? Sort of if I want a cluster on 1,000 nodes, it's actually, it has very bad quality. It has worse quality than something of a uh, small size. So really, now the question is, what does this tell me about the structure of the networks? And the first thing is, what kind, the question is, how do I, what, how do I explain the upward going part? And the way to explain the upward grow, going part is to think of networks um, as I have it here. So here I have a big tree, and this tree like continues down to, uh, you know, to the ground and so on. And the way to think about this is to say, um, that sort of if you have a tree where every node has, um, uh, let's say, twice as many uh, children as, it, as, it, as its par parent does, then you, get, you will get the upward sloping community profile. Why is that? Because first you will say, okay, this is the best community I can get, right? I cut one edge, 
and I get seven. Uh, so if I sum up the degrees, I get um, seven edges inside. So um, you know, here's my conductance. Now I want a bigger cluster. So the way I get a bigger cluster is to cut here. Right now I have to cut two edges to get one additional edge inside. Right. So again, I'm getting worse. Now if I want to make even a bigger cluster, um, right, I would ca have to cut even more edges to get basically to get these two, these two edges um, above in, inside my cluster, right? So basically, the bigger cluster I want, the worse it gets, right? So this is sort of a toy example that says that as I'm trying to get bigger clusters, basically more and more edges I have to cut, so my clusters basically get worse and worse. Um, so that's the first part. The second part is how do I explain this downward part, the green part? And, the, and basically here, it empirically turns out that basically you have lots of these very little uh, pieces that, that, are, that are connected with just a few edges to the rest of the network, right? Um, and basically, this already tells you that your networks have some kind of core periphery structure, right? I have these little clusters on the periphery that get to around 100 nodes large that I can easily cut away and they get sort of better and better as I, as I increase their size. But once sort of I get beyond this critical cluster size, I have to go start cutting into this dense core and my clusters get worse and worse, right? So this is, this is the first sort of the first conclusion. Um, the, um, we call these little pieces, we'll call them whiskers, okay? So why am I telling you this? Because I can do the following. I can take my network, identify my whiskers, um, and then remove them. So I can say, what is, the, what is the community profile of the full network versus what's the community profile of the core of the network only? And what I'm showing you here is the green is the, is, uh, the community profile of only the core and red is of the full network. Um, uh, so what do you see? Basically, you see that very little happens, right? My red curve just shifted upwards and um, um, to the right a bit. So basically, this means that, that even whatever is left, has very similar structure to the, to the original network, right? So really all that happened was that my clusters got a bit worse, even though I removed all the green parts uh, out of the network. So really what this tells you is now that I have a core periphery structure and that this core periphery structure is actually nested, right? So that this core also has a, a layer of periphery and another layer of core, okay? So that's what I can conclude, um, I ca what I can conclude out of this. So, just to summarize, what, what, what do these experiments suggest? So this experiment suggests that when I look at networks that have a couple of thousands of nodes, the way I, I should think about their structure is something, is something like this, right? Sort of I have these con concentric circles that of nodes that get dense, more and more densely connected. And then if I want to get good clusters, all I do is basically I cut away these little whiskers, right? So, you know, there are these little pieces that are very easy to cut away and these are, these are good small clusters. But then when I want to start to find big clusters, I have to start cutting deeper and deeper into the core of my network and these clusters get worse and worse. And just um, empirically, it turns out that 60% um, um, of the nodes and 80% of the edges um, sort of are in the core of the network and the rest is in the, this uh, first layer of the periphery. And this also sort of explains many experiments where people take a large network, do the clustering, and then they find one big cluster that is about half of the size of the network and they call this cluster miscellaneous. And then they find all the other small, and then they interpret all the small clusters, right? So basically they find the core and then they find all the little small pieces, okay? So this is what I wanted to say about the structure of the networks and sort of different communities call this, this kind of structure differently, right? So we call it nested core periphery structure. Um, uh, computer networks community call it jellyfish structure. Mathematicians call it the octopus structure. But at the end, it's basically the same. It's sort of some kind of body with some kind of tentacles uh, um, sticking out. So with this, I hope I convinced you or showed you, demonstrated that networks have this kind of structure. So what I want to do now for the, for the next 20 minutes is to focus on this part of the picture, okay? So now I want to go back and start actually say, oh, but you know, I, really, I was really telling you how, how clusters exist in those networks and now for 20 minutes I was convincing you that there are no clusters, right? So sort of I have to decide what I want to tell you. So I'll go there and I'll, I'll tell you about communities now. <laughs> 
So um, here is the way how we usually do community detection, right? So the way we do it is the following. We go, we take some data set. Maybe I take, for those who, who, who are familiar with networks, I can take the DBLP data set. So these are all the computer science articles pretty much ever published, right? So every node now, um, and out, out of this data, right? So out of this computer science uh, publication data, I can represent it as a graph. I can represent it as a collaboration network, right? So every node is a scientist and I connect to scientists if they wrote a, a, a paper together, right? So I don't know, me and Marco would be connected because we have a joint paper together, right? So now, okay, I have a graph and now I could take my favorite community detection method and I would go detect clusters or communities, right? And then what, what is the next step I do? I go, I examine these clusters and I sort of try to interpret them as I will call them as sort of real communities, right? I maybe go and say, oh, I discovered that based on the basic, based on the network structure, I identify clusters, but then I figure out that all these nodes maybe work in the same area and all these three nodes, you know, uh, publish in the same journal or come from the same university or have something else in common that I don't observe um, in the network, right? So basically I'm just doing normal clustering, right? So um, what we did in the following thing is the following, right? Is to say, can I, if this is the typical pipeline people do, is can I go, can I find data sets where actually I have some kind of notion of ground truth, right? Could I sort of have data sets where I know what the clusters that I'm looking for are, right? And here is basically the idea, right? So, so is the idea was to go and try to find networks where there is an explicit notion of ground truth, right? So if I go back to my collaborations example, right? So maybe a good proxy for the ground truth communities in coll collaboration networks could be conferences or journals, right? You would think that if I take a collaboration network, communities in a collaboration network would correspond to scientific disciplines or sub-disciplines and scientific, scientific disciplines have their own journals. So maybe a good, good proxy for a scientific community is are all the people that publish in the same journal, right? And actually we have that data. We know where the papers were published, right? In social networks, people um, create and join uh, to groups, right? So on Facebook, you can create a group and your friends can join. On many other social networks, you can create groups, right? So again, this can be a notion of ground truth clusters. And um, for example, in information networks, that's another example we will look at is basically you have people that sort of create this, this topically coherent uh, or groups based on topics, right? So really the idea is that I have networks, maybe like this, where every node tells me what community or what group it belongs. And um, in this case, I just drew the, the, way, the example in such a way that every node belongs to a single community, but of course you can belong to multiple groups, right? And the data sets that we were able to find that have where this data is available are, are up here, right? So basically you have um, social networks, um, collaboration network and some Am uh, Amazon product recommendation network, um, number of nodes, number of edges. This is the number of clusters or number of ground truth groups that I see. Um, S is the average size of the group and A is the average number of groups a, no a node belongs to, right? So in some, in some, um, in some networks, uh, a node belongs to tens of groups while in other, in other networks, nodes don't tell us what groups they belong to. Okay, but this is basically where we, we start. So what we have now is I have a network and for every node, I sort of know what group it belongs to, what cluster it belongs to. Okay, so if I have this kind of data, what can I do? So there are two important things that I can do now, right? So the first thing is I can actually start going and saying, right, before I was telling you a group is a set of nodes that has lots of connections um, between the members and few pointing outside, right? Now I can take these ground truth groups and say, oh, do they really have that property, right? Is this really the property that I should be looking for in my networks if I want to identify these clusters, right? So really, the question is, I can empirically study how do these groups map on the top of the network, and this will give me insights how to de design better community detection algorithms. Um, the second thing that's also important is that now I can build sort of proper evaluation methods, right? I can sort of start computing the accuracy of my, uh, my clustering or my community detection algorithm. What I mean by that is that I can take my, my empty network, like, so, uh, like I have it up there, I do my, my community detection method, and now I can say how well does, for example, this community correspond, uh, you know, do this, all these clusters, all these nodes that I, that, that I identified belong to a community here, do they really belong to the same community, right? Maybe I, here, you see, I, I was able to, I, my method identified this community correctly, 
but it totally screwed up in this part of the network, right? So now I can measure um, uh, accuracy of my method, right? So this is basically what I can do, and I'll give you examples of both of these uh, cases, right? So if I now want to study how do these real groups map on the, on, the, on the top of the network, here is the most simple question you can ask. You can say, I have two nodes. Um, they share k groups, so they, they belong to k group, they have k groups in common. What is the probability that uh, uh, you and we will be linked? Linked as a number of uh, groups they have in common, okay? Sort of super simple question. So the way people have thought about this is the following, right? So, so the first view of network community detection, which is the intuition I was telling you all along about finding sets of nodes with lots of connections between the members and few outside, tell you that, um, you know, you don't, you are not connected. Basically, you only belong to a single group, so this question doesn't even apply. So the, the mental picture of the network you have in your head is something like that, right? Then the next thing is to say, okay, what if my groups overlap? And the way people think about overlapping groups today is basically something like this. Basically, they say that there are these nodes, the red ones that belong to multiple groups, but these red nodes are basically, they don't link to one another. So the assumption is that the probability of an edge decreases as, a, as, a, as, a num as the number of common groups increases between the two people, right? Which sort of um, maybe doesn't make too much sense. So what you can actually do is, given that we have this ground truth, I can go and measure this, right? So what I have here is uh, for every pair of nodes, I ask how many groups do you have in common, right? How many common groups do you belong to versus what's the probability of an edge, right? And uh, the thing goes up, right? So really, what does this tell me? Right, so the, the, the thing this tells me is the following, right? Is it tells me that the more groups we have in common, the more likely we are to be connected, right? Which basically means that the, the more communities overlap in, in a particular part of the network, the more edges are there in that part of the network, right? So just to give you a little picture, right? So the way, the way I can think about this is the following, right? So here I have um, three little example networks, and here I have the corresponding adjacency matrices, right? So nodes, nodes, uh, empty space means there is no edge, uh, dot means there is an edge, right? So really, um, if I buy, if I think of network communities as some kind of graph partitioning problem, then I'm making an assumption that my adjacency matrix looks like this, right? I have a cluster, lots of connections, another cluster, and a few connections between the two clusters. If I buy, for example, or if, I, if my picture, my notion of network communities is uh, this of sort of finding articulation points, which is, which is what um, click percolation method does and so on, then really what the way I think of adjacency matrices is the following, right? I have two clusters, they overlap, but the overlap is less well connected than each of the two non-overlapping parts of the cluster. Right? And sort of what happens, the intuition that comes from the plot on the previous slide is the following, right? Is if I have two communities that overlap, then I have the most edges in the overlap, right? So really, my point is that the world is not like that, but it's like this, right? And um, now the question is, how can I go detect communities, my how can I go detect clusters if, if clusters have such a structure, right? Because methods that base that are based on this intu that intuition or this intuition will fail in this case, right? So the question is, um, how do I still go and detect clusters? So the way I will do this is the following. I will, I will basically do like a model-based community detection. So I will show you a very simple model of how networks can be generated, and then we will feed that model back to the data. Right? So my model is very simple. It is a, basically um, what I will call, my, I will call my model a, a community affiliation graph model. So the, the structure is very simple. So the bottom line are my nodes of the network. Uh, the, the top are my communities. A node is connected to the communities it belongs to. So all the green nodes belong to the community A. All the blue nodes belong to the community B. And all the uh, red nodes, they belong to both communities. Right. So very simple. So all it says is now I, have, um, uh, now I have my nodes of the social network at the bottom. I have communities on the top and edges mean memberships. So now the question is given this kind of uh, graph, how do I generate the social network? The way I will generate the social network is very simple. For every pair of nodes, I will just say, uh, and for every community that they have in common, I will flip a coin and with that particular probability that I have up there, the coin will give me an edge. Right? So um, 
the, uh, and of course, now it's very easy to see that if, if I have, if these two nodes have communities in common, they get to flip one coin and they get to flip another coin, right? So the more communities we have in common, the more, the more coins we get to flip, the more likely we, we will have an edge uh, between us, right? So it very naturally models uh, the plot that I showed you before, sort of that um, there are more edges if we share more communities, right? So uh, here's the formula, right? A probability of an edge is simply, um, of I go over all the communities we have in common. This is the probability that the, that not basically, and this is the probability that none of these coin flips succeeds, right? If at least one of them succeeds, we create an edge between uh, my nodes of the social network, right? So now what I have is I have a model of how networks can be generated. Um, what is cute is actually that, that this, you can mathematically analyze this model and, for example, prove that you can get power low degree distributions and all um, other nice things. But that's sort of not important for us. What is important for us is that we have this model of networks that is parameterized by, by these parameters, right? I have my vertex set, so my nodes of the social network. I have my communities, my squared nodes. I have my membership edges, and I have these parameters that tell me how likely are two nodes to be connected if they belong to that particular common community, right? So what I can do now is I can do the following thing, right? So what I showed you so far was to say if I, if I give you this kind of bipartite graph, you know how to generate a network, right? For every uh, pair of nodes here, you flip a coin and you connect them there. What I can also do is I can go the other way. I can say, uh, given the network, figure out uh, the model, right? So figure out this bipartite graph. Um, so what do I mean by figure out the graph? Figure out uh, the structure of this network, figure out the number of communities, so the number of squared nodes, and figure out the parameters, this uh, parameters p up there, right? Um, and again, the thing is that uh, you, we can go and do that. Um, the way we do that is, um, is sort of it's relatively simple. So it's a simple maximum likelihood um, estimation problem, right? I'm just saying, um, given my graph, what is the most likely uh, model that has, uh, that, has uh, given, uh, gi that, that could have generated my real graph? And um, the way I solve this at the end is basically I, I'm doing some kind of coordinate, uh, coordinate ascent, where in the first step I'm sort of changing the structure of my graph, and in the second step I'm uh, fixing my graph and I'm figuring out what this parameter, this linking probability should be. And I up, uh, repeat this uh, long enough and sort of I converge and find a good graph, okay? So um, this, is, um, this is the point and the idea is that actually if you do this on synthetic data and measure how well are you doing, um, it sort of works well in practice. But what's important now is the following, right? Is that I can take the graph, my social network, and I can figure out my community affiliation graph, right? I can figure out for every node what communities it belongs to, just given, given uh, a graph like that. And then the other thing I can do, I can also go back and say, now I, when I fitted the model to the data, I really discovered communities because I, I, dis I decided which nodes belong to what communities. So now I can go and start comparing my, uh, my inferred communities with real communities. So what I mean by that is, right, I can take my network, my, these colors correspond the real group memberships, and maybe this um, um, uh, circle source, this set, sets indicate the inferred community memberships, right? And now I can say, you know, how well, how well did I discover these colors b based solely on the network structure? And there are few me measures or metrics that are very standard in computer science to um, evaluate uh, this kind of uh, uh, problems, right? So there is the F score, the F1 score, the precision and recall. You can measure the mutual information between the discovered communities and the true communities, or you can um, quantify something that is called omega index. And then for comparison, I will show you, I will compare my method, right? So what is my method? Given a network, I want to find the parameters of this model, which basically means that I, I found the group memberships, and now I will compare how good groups I find versus the two standard methods. One is um, called click percolation, and the other one was just published. Um, it's called link clustering. So, and both these me methods find groups that overlap, right? Sort of, they allow nodes to belong to multiple groups. And um, if we run our method, um, here is how well it's doing. Um, these are, so I have different data sets. 
different scores, higher is better. What I'm showing you is a relative improvement of our method over, in this case, the link clustering, right? Um, and uh, what you see is that here, for example, we, are, we do 70 times better in deciding how many communities are there in the network. And we also do better in terms of the F score and omega index. But in terms of mutual information, we do a bit worse. So this is for link clustering. And this is results for the click percolation. Um, and again, sort of we detect communities that correspond to the real ones much better than the click percolation method. Um, the other thing I wanted to show is also, so another way how you can look at this is just sort of to say, here is the performance of, let's say, click percolation versus the performance of the other, of our method uh, for the three different um, uh, performance metrics. If, if the dot is above the diagonal, we do better. If it's below the diagonal, the competition does better. Um, here it's no, is no doubt that sort of we do better than link clustering. For click percolation, actually, we also do much better, right? So this is just a visual way to look at that previous table. That sort of at, uh, at all size range, or at all sort of quality ranges, uh, we find better clusters. Um, so just to give you maybe a small example of, of how, how you find clusters. So what is this is, is an is a ego network of one of my students. So this is a, uh, one of my Korean students who took all his uh, Facebook friends and then tried to uh, label, uh, put them into different groups. And he, he, he decided he, he has four groups of his friends. He has sort of friends from his Korean high school, um, 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 friends from his workplace, basically eBay, where he did an internship. And then he has two sets of Stanford friends. One with whom he plays squash, and the other one uh, uh, are his sort of uh, basketball friends. And um, the, what I show you here is um, um, every is the communities our method was able to identify. For example, these are nodes that don't belong to any to any of the groups that our um, uh, the student did not, decided not to classify. And uh, open circles are the, are the mistakes, right? So full circles are the are the nodes where we made the correct guess. And the, the empty circles are the mistakes. But what I want to show you here is basically that the place where the communities overlap has far the most edges, right? So sort of if you play basketball and squash and you are at Stanford, then you are more much more likely to know each other than if you play basketball and somebody else works at eBay, for example, right? So having more in common, at least in social networks, gives you uh, more links. So, what, like, um, basically, this is all I wanted to say. So let me just sort of summarize what, what were the points that I wanted to make today. So the first one was we, we, we defined this network community profile plot, basically to be able to analyze the community structure of networks. Uh, we saw that in small networks, the, the, this plot has a downward slope, while for large networks, it starts going upwards. So basically, it's important to, lar to look at large data. Um, and basically, the, the discovery or the conclusion from the shape of that plot is that networks have this kind of core periphery structure, right? So sort of it's like cutting an onion, if you like. Um, so that was one thing. And then the other thing we, we looked at was then saying, OK, but what about communities and clusters in networks? So we, we went and took networks where we have ground truth labels for the clusters. The empirical observation we made was that if two clusters overlap, the, the probability uh, of an edge there is higher than in the non-overlapping parts of the cluster. Based on this, we developed this bipartite model of group affiliations. And we were able to feed the model to the data to be able to, um, to detect communities. Just on average, we, are we outperform the existing methods for 30 to 60%. Um, but really, now the question is sort of the answer to my original question, how does the core periphery structure um, feed back to the, to the network communities? I think that now um, is, is sort of easy to see, right? So if you have communities that overlap, and the more communities overlap, the, the, the more edges you will have in that part of the network, then this is completely consistent. Um, with that, right? So that basically you have networks where in the core of the network there are many different overlapping communities, while, while in the periphery you sort of have people that maybe belong to one or maybe even zero communities. And this way you can sort of put the two maybe diff somehow different views of networks in the literature on the common ground. Um, so with that, uh, I'm done and I'll be very happy to take questions. Thanks.